Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today we're taking on truly the most horrific subject thus far on the podcast. How do you split your pets? Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Seth Nelson with my good friend Pete Wright, and we're joined today by Karis Nafti, dog trainer and animal specialist from South Africa. She also just so happens to be an internationally accredited family mediator. In her work, she combines her wealth of experience of dogs and family pets with mediation to help her clients make the best decisions for their pets' well-being. Welcome to the toaster. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay, Karis, this is going to be great. I'm very excited about this. I've got my dog with me here just as my spiritual guide for this conversation. We are actually following up on this conversation we started last week about personal property. And this week, you know, talking now about our precious family pets. How do we handle the family pets in the personal property decision? And I asked the question to Seth. I said, Seth, are pets personal property? And Seth dutifully dodged the answer with something about local jurisdictions. And now we have you as an expert to help us think about both our relationships with our animals in a divorce and, more importantly, their healthy relationships with us. Now, Karis, before you get started, I just have to tell you, I'm a huge dog lover. My son is even a bigger dog lover. And I told him that you were coming on the show. And he says, you can get a job doing that? Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, it's good work if you can get it, buddy. But I can't wait to hear all about it. (laughs) So how did you even get started in pet custody in dividing up fur kids? I didn't try to do this job. I This job found me. So I've been working with dogs and training dogs and helping people with behavior problems for about 25 years. And I hate saying that because it makes me feel old, but it's true. So I have a lot of experience with really everything you can imagine with dogs, good stories, bad stories, everything in between. What I noticed about 10 years ago was I was seeing dogs who were having pretty rough behavior, behavior issues. And the reason that they were having those issues, I could trace it back to during a divorce, the custody decision wasn't right for the dogs. It was right for the people, but it wasn't actually right for the dogs. And now we were having lots of behavior problems coming out weeks and months and even years later. And after helping these people after the fact, which is you know heartbreaking and expensive and messy at that stage, I realized, hang on, Someone has to come in during the divorce, actual divorce process with the point of view of the dog. It's most of my work is with dogs. I mean, I work with everything. (laughs) Got some good stories, but most of my work is with dogs. And, And so I became a mediator and now I combine my work as a mediator and an animal behaviorist and a dog trainer to help meet people at that moment to say, listen, Let's look at what your dog needs. And as you say, the law says this, and in different states and in different countries, the law says different things. And from my point of view, I obviously know what the laws are, and we have to work in respect to the laws, but I'm not that interested in what the law says about the dog. I'm interested in what the dog needs. And that's where I try to work with my people, with my clients. This is fascinating to me. I have never tried a case where we had to decide where the dog would go. People will argue about it, and we typically settle that issue. And if it would come up in court, it might be, well, this is the person who really took care of the dog and did all the kind of work with the dog, but it would be maybe three to five questions out of a two-day trial. But having you on to discuss this in more detail, I am so excited to have this conversation today. It's just fascinating how you got to where you are today. You said most of your work is in, in, involves dogs. Are, are dogs generally more impacted, less impacted? What what uh, species is most impacted in a divorce? It's mostly dogs that, that I do work okay. with because cats... They're pack animals, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, and someone from the pack just left. Some Someone from the pack left and where did, where who who does he go to and, and where does it go? I think the reason that I deal more with dogs is obviously as many people have cats as dogs, but 
cats are a lot less mobile. So a lot of the people I work with were having a question of, should we do shared custody for this particular dog? Which is not something that comes up very often with cats because cats don't like to move quite so much. So it tends to be more obvious with couples who should keep the cat. So I don't get as many calls for advice with cats. It is mostly dogs. I've done a parrot, a couple of pigs, but mostly dogs. Yeah. <laughs> pigs. That's exactly where I hoped we'd end up. <laughs> shared, shared pig custody. I, this is uh, delightful. We, you, you already brought up custody and shared custody. And I really want to talk about that because that's, that's the thing we know, uh, the, the least about here. And we usually approach custody questions from the perspective of those, you know, who can hold a pen. Uh, and so you have the parents and you have the kids weighing in and everybody talks about that. The, the question of shared versus sole custody seems to be always left up to the parents who are most impacted by, by the animal. You know, who they, it's the kids, they love the dog more. But, but I feel like this question, you know, could inevitably end up uh, in a shared custody where the dog is, is going on one of those wonderful movies of a thousand miles across the Rocky Mountains to, to try to find their true home. Uh, how do you know you're making the right decision? when it comes to custody of your animal. Yeah, like what do you look for? How, how does it work? That's why it's interesting, guys, because it's not that obvious. Um, so I'm going to answer that question in two ways. So the Fring, when I, I work with a lot of attorneys and mediators, just giving them advice about their clients. So my default advice is that if the clients are willing, that it should be written into the agreement that regardless of what decision is made about the dogs, it gets reassessed three months later to see if the dog is coping because dogs have very obvious signs of stress if you know what you're looking for. And so we often don't know at the time. So if it's a question of should we do shared custody or not? I will look at things like the history of the dog. Is it a rescue dog? Is it a dog that's had a, a quite a stressful life where transitions have been difficult or his home hasn't been very stable? I will look at the breed of the dog. So sometimes you'll get, um, call them more working breeds like uh, German Shepherds and Malinois. Um, one of my dogs, I have an Australian cattle dog who loves me, but He'd run off with my husband in a second if he left me and like wouldn't even look back. <laughs> so certain <laughs> so, <laughs> so certain breeds of dogs tend to bond more with one person. That's how they're wired. So for them to do a shared custody is quite traumatic. There's other breeds of dogs that like, meh, they don't care. Like, whatever. Life's cool. Okay, so I have two miniature dachshunds. One is named Theo. He's a long hair. And the other one is Penny. Theo, we've had since he was a puppy. In Penny, we had since Penny was about 18 months old. So what about miniature dachshunds? <laughs> We're getting into some quite specific therapy here. Very I didn't know specific. we were going there. All Listen, right. Seth, you can, yes. you, you can call me after and we'll have a session. Okay, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> I love that answer. And I'm not even trying to split up with anybody. I love my girlfriend very much. And I'm trying to make sure that one day when we move in together, then uh, I can bring my dogs with me. So <laughs> I think she would actually take them more than she'll take me. But that's another story. <laughs> I was going to say the dogs already love her more. Seth. Don't even yeah. settled science. Exactly. So don't, don't even ask. That's my advice. If it's me or yeah. the dog, don't even ask that question. It's never a good, yeah. good one. <laughs> so this OK, but it's a fair question. So. I wouldn't, I don't want to make a generalization about any breed. I don't want anybody listening to say, oh, well, that lady said that this breed can and can't. Every case has to be looked at differently. And if it really isn't an, a clear, obvious choice, that's why I put in place my, my, my check-in three months later. It's like, okay, then we can assess. So what are the signs three months when you're assessing, like, like stressful things for dogs? Okay. So, so dogs will show stress in a lot of different ways. And the main, one of the, they will change their the character in some way. So for some dogs, they'll get very, very withdrawn. So if it was sort of a bouncy, happy, full of life kind of dog, uh, they may withdraw. They may start spending a lot of time alone in a room or, or they just seem like they don't have the energy they used to have. You will get other dogs who go the opposite way. They become manic. They cannot settle. You know, everybody these days 
kind of loves the word anxiety. That's a little bit of a soapbox of mine. So they will say, oh, my dog's just has so much anxiety. And, and normally what that means is your dog's just got a little too much energy in their body. They don't know what to do with it. And it needs an outlet, but that can be a sign of stress. The more hectic things that I deal with, the more complicated stuff is sometimes dogs start to get snappy and aggressive. They'll behave aggressively. They can get genuinely very aggressive. Um, they will get destructive. So they'll start chewing up the furniture and they'll start chewing up the garden. They might become aggressive to dogs when before they were friendly. Some dogs I see start um, chewing on their bodies, you know, like they chew their pads or they lick themselves raw and they pull off parts of their hair, that sort of thing. So this is all change in, in behavior. Yeah. That's what the key thing you're looking for. Yeah. And when you're doing yeah. this. And I've got a really like I've got an easy, a, a good story that illustrates. I've got a couple of good stories, but this the one of the very first clients, and it was actually it was two miniature Doshans. I'm not I'm not even making that upset. So this applies there to we you. Go, there we go. Pete. See, okay, right. coming see, back around. Right. See, you Seth, Seth and I are in sync, and we didn't even discuss <laughs> this beforehand. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Karis, we're in sync now until I tell you what we call in my family proud parenting moments and proud parenting moments or when you do really something poorly as a parent. Like, it's very sarcastic. So we're on sync now. You're not going to like me in a few moments. Oh, okay. okay. But, but continue about the dachshunds. Okay. Okay. So I had a client who had two dachshunds, and they he called me because his dogs were peeing on the couch, which I deal with a lot. So I said, okay. And in getting a history, it came to be that the dogs only peed on the couch every two weeks. I said, well, that's very odd. What happens every two weeks? He says, well, every second weekend they go with my to my ex-girlfriend. And then they spend time with her. And when they come home, they, they pee on the couch for about three days. And it's very obvious to me and anyone who works with dogs that that sort of peeing on the couch is a stress reliever. It's an it's sort of an anxious behavior. And as the story came out and I and and I got more of a history and I met the I met the girlfriend and all of that. The dogs were really bonded with their dad. They they really, that's where they wanted to be. It was not a nice transition when they went to the girlfriend. They fought every time, the pickup and the drop off, every time was a fight. And what I helped them see was that the truth is they weren't that interested in the dogs, that, that there was just an attempt to keep the relationship going in a little bit of a unhealthy way. So that was a good example of how dogs show stress. So the so I said, look, let's experiment. Let's keep the dogs just with dad for a few months. And, and the peeing stopped and the dogs were happy and everything was easy. So that's a very obvious example of what the kind of stuff that I deal with a lot. I That actually brings up a really interesting question to me. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's not interesting to anybody but me, but the, this idea of using the pets as some sort of tool in the separation, whether it's to, like you say, to keep the the you know relationship moving in some direction or where the the pets become a vessel of something else i see that all the time not just in items or the kids using them as weapons or the pets as a vessel to stay in the relationship and keep a connection even as kara says it's a unhealthy way to stay in a relationship the thing that i see most often is people staying in the litigation they don't settle their case because that's the only thing that still connects them. Wow. They're just not ready to let go and move on with their lives. And those will end up going to trial and there will be an emotional release at the end of trial that is not so much the outcome of the trial. That's when a judge says, you're now divorced. So I see it all the time. I'm sure Kara sees it with the dogs, correct? All the time, all really all the time. And I, what I find is when people are willing to work with me, most of the time, they're kind of at a point, and, and I will say this to people, joking, half joking, I say, if you need to carry on fighting, I understand that, but let's not fight over the dog because the dog's going to get stressed. So if we can at least have that conversation and look at the dog for what it is, and not keep the fight stuck on the dog, then then something moves and something shifts. Absolutely, it happens. It's often, often not about the dog. Sometimes it is, but yeah, that's the that's the reality of it. Is there ever a shared custody situation that that works? I mean, you say it so often depends on the on the dog, on the breed, on the relationship. Is that something that you've ever been able to recommend? 
Yeah, I have. So it, it's very often um, a lot of my clients who've got children that move back and forth. What they want to arrange is that the dog moves with the children. And if bo- if this works well for both parents, for many dogs that this works for, the children are sort of the steady factor. So they kind of get yeah. it and they move, you know, with Billy and Sally or whoever. Um, and the main factor that works in shared custody is what is the relationship like with the two people? Is it is it cleanly over and they can exchange this dog peacefully and without a lot of emotional stuff? If the relationship is not cleanly over and it's it's a very stressful handoff every time, the dogs just can't cope with that. They they absorb it like a sponge. So if the people are okay with each other, if it's the sort of dog that's got a really easygoing nature and, you know, I mean, again, I'm not, let's picture, for example, a golden retriever, but it can be any easygoing dog. They are very often more okay with it. And it doesn't have to be children. It can be shared. But what I do tell people is, is that when you, if you are considering shared custody, you need to know that the shared custody is not for the benefit of the dog. It is for the benefit of the people. So some people, they, they kind of think, oh, my, my dog can't say goodbye to me. And that's not true. Dogs are very good at saying goodbye. People are not good at saying goodbye. So the question is more, can the dog tolerate shared custody, not, oh, for the doggy's sake, we're going to do shared custody. That's what people have to at least be clear about. Oh, that's really interesting. They're actually trying to do something positive for their dog, but it might be more stressful for them. Absolutely. Going back and forth. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. I can imagine that is a central challenge in your work is reminding people of that point and getting them to believe it. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's, um, listen, I will tell you almost everything Kara said on stress going back and forth, not making the dog the issue. It's about the dog. It's not about us, the parents. You can just insert the word kids. Yeah. You, unfortunately, parents will fight over kids and use them as tools. It's not about you, it's about the kids. But what makes it difficult? in much, much different with kids is I don't think, and Karis, this is I'm posing this as a statement. It's really a question for you. Does one party say, well, I'm just not good with the dog, so they should stay? Because I'm never going to have a parent that says, I'm just not a good parent. I think the kid should be with the other parent. Like that does not happen in my world. How about in your world with dogs. Like I'm not really a dog person. It was always her dog. It's not a big decision. Yeah. They, uh, people in that situation don't need my help. So, so it's not an issue. It's, yeah. I, I love hearing stories like that where it's just clear and it's not a fight. So yeah, I, I think there are plenty of people like that who don't, they want their freedom, you know, they want to move into a, or they want freedom to travel or whatever it is. So it, it just depends on everybody. But what is interesting, I had another case where a husband and a wife separated. They, they got a divorce. They had three little kids and they had a German shepherd who was about four. And she called because the, she called me after the fact because the dog was chewing up her couch, like all of her furniture. And at the time of divorce, the parents weren't fighting at all. They just said, well, the dog should, of course, stay with the kid. You've got the big yard. You've got the kids. That's that's who should keep the dog. But the dad in this story used to take the dog for a run every morning, like religiously. He would work the dog and and train it. And then when he moved out, he stopped. And the mom didn't have time to run this dog because she was like totally at her hands full. She loved the dog, but she had three kids. So what's she going to do? And the reason the dog was chewing up the couch, he was so frustrated at his, at his, now he's missing this, you know, German shepherds, they need to, they need to be useful in the world. They need to feel like they have a purpose. And even if that purpose is catching a Frisbee for an hour, they need it. And so I chatted to them after, and I said, actually, this dog probably needs his exercise more than the kids. So the dad ended up with the dog. He had a smaller yard and he worked full time, but he still worked the dog every day and the dog was happy. So that does also happen, interestingly. But then I usually have to come in when things have gone wrong to try to help. I don't work my kids hard enough. That's the truth. Yeah. Get them out there, beat, do the dishes, do something. Yeah. They need to be catching more Frisbees, frankly. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to share with you, Karis, my worst, quote, proud parenting moment. Okay. I am then going to give myself a very weak defense (laughs) to this issue that any jury would hang me and string me up. Okay. Remember, my kid's a huge dog lover. Okay. And one morning, I, when he woke up, it was on a weekend. 
I told him, I'm going to get you a puppy. And he just started smiling. And then the next words out of my mouth were, April Fool's. The worst thing I've ever done to my child. I am laying it out there. I'm being vulnerable. I assure you, it's like dead silence on this podcast. Now you should see their faces, like jaw dropping like everyone else just did. I, anything you say is not even close to how badly I beat myself up over this for the last 10 to 11 years because my son is now 16. So he was like five or six. Horrible. When he was five, Seth? Pete, I told you this was my worst proud parenting moment ever. And I told you that I wasn't even going to tell you what it was going to be because I knew you would be coming at me. But what's even worse, Pete, is I got silence out of you. That's the first time ever. Yeah. Do you know you disappointed oh, dad? Huge. That's what you got just now. Now, are you ready yeah. for my weak defense, Karis? I guess. I mean, what am I going to do? Go for it. I, I <laughs> <laughs> has lost faith in the podcast, in you I as know. a host, and maybe as an attorney. This is just all a big mistake. Okay, go for it, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get my son a puppy. I got him Theo, the miniature dachshund that we discussed briefly earlier. Granted, it was about 10 years later. I said this was a weak defense. <laughs> Which he points out to me every time this comes up. And when he, when I told him you were coming on the podcast, he said, you're going to talk about your proud parenting moment. And I said, I really don't want to. He goes, you have to. So there it is. <laughs> I am bearing my soul. I am not perfect okay. by any stretch. Okay, so if your son is listening, which I'm sure he will, I'm sorry. And I can only hope if you end up with 700 dogs in your life later, your dad will know it's all his fault. That's all I can say. That's right. And I'll have to fund and it. That, that you send him the bill <laughs> exactly. for yeah for food and shots. And yeah, they will be the healthiest, most Which actually dogs. leads me to a question, Karis, to get the topic off me and my proud parenting moment. Do you deal with how the expenses go for the dog? Because that's an issue that does come yeah, up. Yeah, it is an issue that comes up. So I... I, it depends on the client, but everybody I work with has either a divorce attorney or a mediator that they're working with. So I don't get too much into the finances because I don't know the rest of the story of the couple. I don't know who's paying for what or what the maintenance story is. So I do work with them on, you know, who gets to choose the vet, um, end of life things, you know, if this is an elderly dog, who's going to make the decision about when the dog, if the dog needs to get put down and that sort of thing. But the actual uh, finances, no, I let the, I work in collaboration with their mediator or attorney to sort of incorporate that into the rest of the household. If, if you can hear something in the background, that is my dogs. I apologize. Yeah. My husband's under strict instructions to keep them quiet. I've got four dogs downstairs. So yeah. It's a podcast. We're talking about dogs. I think they get to chime in. In fact, I, yeah, I might just take it and loop it in the background. <laughs> so there's always dog. Thinking about this whole idea uh, where somebody brings an animal into the relationship and the animal falls in love with the other person. Yeah. How does how does that work out in a dog as yeah. shared property. That's a rough one sometimes. <laughs> so wait, Conflict. wait a minute. Let me get this straight now, Pete. I bring my dogs into the relationship. My dogs fall in love yeah. with my girlfriend, wife, and now we're splitting up and my I've got to swallow the pill, Karis, that I have to leave my dogs with her. Is that what you're about to tell me? Maybe. Seth, at this point, dogs are not staying with you ever. <laughs> no. Like, so let's let's go ahead and not use you as an example. Yeah. You're okay. Now, just for the record, now I'm going to defend myself strongly, and then we'll get to this question. Karis, <laughs> as you know, two miniature dachshunds, they're not supposed to be jumping on and off of furniture because it's very bad for their back. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. In my son's bed, I have built a ramp for the dogs to go up to get in and out of his bed. And then in my room, and he's got like a loft bed that we did so we can incorporate this. In my room, I actually pulled my bed out from the wall about eight inches because they're very small dogs. And we have a ramp behind my bed for the dogs to come up <laughs> and say where they're not jumping on and off the bed. So a little defense for me, Pete. That's, Thank that's you great. very that sounds much. Like you've, sounds like you've done the bare minimum. Good job. I'll, I will give you some credit for that. That's more than a lot of people do. 
So well done. That's good. But talk about right. this. When the dog falls in love with the non-owner, so to speak. So dogs don't know they have an owner. So I have to help people see things from their dog's perspective. You can't look at the past. As far as the dog is concerned, you, you it's not. It is important for people's emotional clarity to look at the story and how things evolved. But for the dog's sake, you have to look at where are they today and what's going to happen after this separation. And who's going to actually, not just who do the dogs love, but who who's going to have the space and the time and, and who's willing and, and wants to work, you know, spend the time to be with the dogs. And if the dogs have genuinely bonded with your girlfriend, the question you have to ask is, do you love them enough to let them go? Oh, wow. That was poetry right there. Right there. Dagger to the heart. I'm telling you. Like the only answer to that is yes. Otherwise I'm like digging a hole that I'm already like halfway to yeah, China. No, I can't right. see your head anymore. Right. Uh, okay. That, that's a great answer and it's perfect. What do you, where, what, what about judges? Hmm. When you uh, do you have you have you dealt with judges and what's your experience with how judges? Yeah, have you been an expert witness? Have you been in court? No, I haven't been an expert witness in court. No, and I'm sure I will be at some stage. I'm not really looking forward to it. Um, I just I try to work with people as much as possible to avoid the judge making the decision. If if they yeah. in working with me, it's like it's not fair as my role in a mediator sense to then come and, and, and try to take sides. So right. the whole point of working with me is we don't want a judge to decide because a judge doesn't know your dog. They might know the law. They might give the dog to whoever is, has, you know, their name is on the dog's ownership papers. So it's not a judges love me because I keep the dog out of the equation, but yeah, right. it is a tricky one. They bring the dog to the courtroom. One person has treats in their pocket, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what, so it's interesting you bring that up because I work online. I mean, I work all over the world. I mean, I, I'm from the States, but I live in South Africa. I work all over the place and people say, but don't you need to see the dog? How do you work with people without actually seeing the dog? And what's interesting is the dogs actually confuse things because I need the story. I need the history. I need to understand the people's relationship with the dog and seeing the dog for an hour or two isn't actually going to show me what I need to see because it's just going to be a moment and people can't help but kind of manipulate that moment to try to get me on mm -hmm. their side. So people often know the right answer to the question of working with me. It's just a matter of can we get there together? And I even help people. I mean, when I'm not doing divorce mediation, I'm, I still do behavior work and I do it online. So if people are having behavior problems, I just help them over Zoom and I get video of the problem and I say, cool, I can see what your dog is doing and why. This is what you need to do to fix it. So seeing the dog actually confuses this particular topic. And it seems like this common refrain that you keep trying to jam into my head is that the dog doesn't care about the things that I care about. It's true. Unless it comes to, you know, chicken treats and all that delicious stuff. Yeah. yeah no, they really, they, they, they're animals, you know, and the problem with dogs, dogs are so tuned into people. We've bred them to, to watch and notice our emotions and respond to it. I mean, that's why they're so, that's why they're not cats, you know, that's why they, they're good at what they do. But because of that, we assume they have the same emotions as us, which they don't. They're very simple little creatures. They don't manipulate. Yeah. They don't feel guilty. I mean, my thing, my, I could talk for hours about, you know, those awful videos that people send around of like dog shaming videos and guilty dog videos. They actually make me cry because there is no such thing as a guilty dog. All of the dogs in those videos are terrified. They are so scared of the voice that the owner is using and that staring that people do. And if you study dog behavior, all they're trying to say in, the, in that language, that body language that we in interpret as guilt is they're saying, please don't hurt me. And they're mm -hmm. awful. They're awful. So that's a good example of where you can't, it does dogs a huge disservice to humanize them. They are not little children. They are animals. They're dogs. I just I I'm uh, rendered just a little speechless because I'm just thinking what am I doing to my dog? <laughs> why do I why do I make him wear pants? <laughs> <laughs> See now the tides are turning. I'm just saying. 
I'm not the only bad actor here. <laughs> Seth, what's your experience in the courtroom with animals? You've uh, you've got I mean, it's Florida where you are. You've got you probably have gators and yeah, right? we have all sorts of animal issues that come up. But Karis knows my answer. It They are just deemed property. And if you own that dog um, coming into that marriage in Florida, that's premarital property. That dog's going to stay yours, even if they fell in love with the other spouse. Um, but what Karis is saying is very fascinating to me because you can just insert the word kids. Karis is like, it doesn't really matter what's happened in the past. What's best for them in the future? Now, how do I prove that in court? I show what's happened in the past. So on the example where the parents worked it out with the German shepherd that you gave Karis, I would have been in court saying, this is the dad that gets up every morning and goes for a run and really is bonded with the dog. And they would have said, oh, but the dog likes to sleep in the kid's room. And we would have this thing go back and forth. And then that decision's made. There's not what Karis is talking about where, hey, we got to see how this plays out three months from now, four months from now. Let's see how the dog responds. Like that decision's made. It's over. It's done. We move on. It is not anything qualitative. The other thing, and I'm not bashing the judges at all on this, you also have to understand what the judges deal with on a daily basis. Well, I'll have clients call me and say, my ex is doing this, this, and this to the children. And I'm like, the court system's not set up to deal with that. And they're like, but it's so bad. They talk badly to them. They do this, they do that. And I said, okay, I appreciate that. That behavior shouldn't be happening, but is it at a level where it's so bad the judge is really going to step in because you have a right to raise your children the way you want to raise your children? And if you scold them a certain way, or you have a certain tone of voice, or you do X or you do Y, you don't have to be the perfect parent. You're allowed to parent your children the way you parent your children. And the case before yours is going to be something horrific where parents have left children and they've been sexually assaulted by a relative. So, you, you know, when they when they hear those types of cases that are just awful th- day in and day out, and I am not taking dogs lightly at all, some of them are going to be, it's personal property, it's a dog, what do you want me to do? Let's move on. I got to get to my next case. Mm-hmm. And that's just the human nature of the very difficult job that family law judges have in front of them. So working with someone like Karis and really figuring this out is the way to go. Now, Karis, I do have a question for you because I think people get the emotional attachment. What I've got two questions, really. One is, what about the saying, you can always get another dog? Like, if we're making the right decision and the dogs are going with my girlfriend, is it all right to tell me, Seth, you can always get other dogs? So that's one question. And I also want to know your view on the term fur babies or fur kids because I hear that a lot now. And I just, from an expert, I'd like to get your, your input on that. Cool. Well, those are both very, those are both very good questions. And I think that to answer your first question, it depends on how you say it. Cause if you say it to try to manipulate, you know, if you say, oh, you can just get another dog because I want this dog, then it's not going to be heard well at all. So that's not the kind of, that sort of language it's like, it's just completely in the actual negotiation of the dog, it doesn't help. And it actually hurts to sort of say, well, why don't you just get another dog? It's, it sounds so much more like it's a sign that your relationship is still so fundamentally broken. You're not communicating anymore. You're stabbing one another with words. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And and I do a lot of work with my with my clients. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't work as all mediators do. I do a lot of individual sessions. I, I very much am a go-between because some of the people I'm, I'm working with are not in mediation. They're, they have two attorneys, but they've brought me in to help on this issue. So they can't talk, but I can at least, I can be the go-between to help them. So, but to come back to your question, it's, um, the truth is you can get another dog in the long term because time heals a lot of things. So, it, you know, we've all have stories of that dog we loved. And then at some point in the future, you can get another dog. I mean, but when I work with my people who come to my dog training school, I, I, you know, they often, I mean, I had one family that had a little Yorkshire terrier who drowned in the swimming pool and it was just terrible. And it was a little puppy and they got a dog the next day. They quickly got another one the next day. And I was like, you gotta let it, you know, mourn the dog. Give yourself some time. Yeah. So that sort of thing, I definitely don't. And And I say to people like who with children, it's like, okay, well, 
the dog staying with mom who has a Labrador, don't worry, uh, dad's going to get a Labrador puppy too. It's like, that's not mm-hmm. the right attitude. And you've got to let it wait. And, and then, and the reason that's not right is that new Labrador puppy was bought for the wrong reasons. And I promise you, it's going to have behavior problems later because it won't have been raised exactly in the right way. So that's maybe a good way to answer that first question. As far as fur kids go and fur babies, so I'm going to say this. I love my dogs. I love my children, and I also really love my dogs a lot. Um, (laughs) But fur kids is a dangerous term. And I say dangerous with a little twinkle in my eye because they are not children. And But for a lot of people, they have taken that place of actually being the child. And a lot of the dogs that I see who are having very interesting and difficult behavior problems, it's because they get too much attention. They carry too much emotional weight for the whole family. It's like, imagine a family that has, you know, a child and they've put all their hopes and dreams and he's going to go to Yale and he's going to be perfect. And, and that same family desire, if they put it onto their pit bull puppy, um, it's too much for a dog. They're not meant to be the focus of a household. So it's if you really love your dog, you'll see it for what it is. You won't try to make it more than it is. And love, really loving a dog means understanding what does a dog need? How much exercise does it need? How much time alone does it need? What do good, you know, kind of good boundaries and good training actually look like? Um, but spoil i mean i don't even spoiling isn't even the right word it's making the dog too important in your life is actually stressful on dogs so for kids as that sort of language where people are so kind of living their life around and i mean i'm i'm saying this as someone who literally spends all day with dogs my whole life is about dogs but i really see them as this beautiful canine, this this relative of a wolf that you know wants to chase things that move and and pretend to kill them and roll and poop and eat poop and do you know do dog things, they're not little fuzzy kids. So it's important that people can make that distinction, just in the way that they love their dog, love them as a dog, don't love them as a child substitute. It hurts the dogs. And and on that point, I think to build off of that is, I think. If you're dealing with this, getting a divorce, what are we going to do with the dog and you have kids? It it seems to me one thing that people should keep in mind is when you're talking to kids about divorce, it's the parents, your, you know, your dad and I, your mom and I, we're going to make the best decisions we think for you. And depending on the age of the kid, you might have some input, but you don't get to make the final decision. But then when talking to kids about what's going to happen with the dog, is we're going to make the best decision for the dog. And that might be at mommy's house. It might be at daddy's house. It might be going back and forth. But we're going to look at this behavior and see how it's going. And let's say it's at dad's house and you're at my house, mom's house. And down the road, we want to get a dog later. Then we'll discuss that at a later time. But we're not doing that tomorrow. Is that a good way to approach it, you think, with children? Absolutely. It's so, and I think it's such a good lesson for kids. If kids can shift that, depending on how old the kid is, if shift, if kids can shift their perspective to understand that, wow, I love my dog enough that yes, I want my dog to be happy. Maybe I won't see him every single day, but when I do see him, he'll be happy. Um, and then, yeah, it's like, listen, once our life is sort of, we found a new routine, let's see if we've got time for a dog. You know what, when parents separate, it's a whole new thing being a single parent. It's the the amount of time and, you know, depending on the custody arrangement, it's, it's, it's challenging. So you need to know, are we going to have time? Can we be good dog parents in this way? And yeah, it's a very, it can be handled and, and used as such a good lesson. If the parents, if the parents can have that attitude and kind of share it with their kids, it's great. I think it's so great. I, I think it's the whole idea that, you know, if you develop a healthy relationship with your dog and allow that healthy relationship with a dog to be developed with you, uh, then it makes it it makes divorce, the divorce process easier for everybody, right? For the dog, for the kids, for the parents, everybody. Um, I, it sounds like your work m- might extend beyond the the confines of the divorce process do you do you help people acclimate with their pets to to the new relationship beyond divorce 
Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, so with a lot of, I've got a few different hats. So I have my pet mediator hat in that actual divorce negotiation. And then I work with people after the divorce. It's like, okay, well, Rover's doing X, Y, and Z. Let's work with it. Or some of my clients just before the dogs had a chance to sort of have behavior problems, they still want some support um, just going through it. And then I will put my dog trainer hat on and my behavior consultant hat on and say, cool, that decision has been made. Now I can take a deep breath, whatever the decision is, shared custody, not shared custody, and let's work with it. So I do, I change, I, I change gears depending on what people need. Cause I, I get very attached to these people and dogs that, that I, I love makes me so happy that I can offer this, this sort of support to people. I, it's like, I can't even tell you, I, I talk to my other dog trainer friends and they go, Oh my God, that sounds like the worst thing in the world. You know, they just want to teach puppy school. And I say, well, it's great. I, I, it's wonderful. I love it. I love it. This has been fantastic. Karis, where, uh, where can people learn more about your work? Where would you like to send them online to learn about what you do? And, and are you, are you taking new folks who, who are, who, who need your help? Yes. Yeah, I am. Absolutely. You know, I try to, I, 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 when I work with people, I say, we want to try to work with this as quick as possible. We don't need to draw it out. So I, I get new clients in all the time and then it's, and then it's over and it's resolved and, and we can move forward. So if people want to reach me, my website is called who keeps the dog.com, who keeps the dog.com. And they can find me there. Um, easy to remember. And I'm on Instagram as my name, which is at Karis Nafti, K-A-R-I-S-N-A-F-T-E. And you can find me on LinkedIn there as well. Karis, thanks for coming on How to Split a Toaster. It's been such a joy. I learned a lot. And I think a lot of our listeners are going to be able to refocus when they're thinking about this issue in a different way. And that's why we're here. So when we're talking about How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. That includes your pets, especially your dogs. Definitely. Thank you, guys. It's been awesome to be here. And to everybody out there listening, uh, we put together a new form on the website. It's a little button and you can ask a question. And if you want to ask a question and uh, uh, drop your question to us, if it's a question that we can send to Karis, maybe she can jot us a quick note. We'll follow up in the uh, uh, in the coming weeks. So. And if you have any other questions that you want us to discuss on any other topics, send them our way. We're happy to uh, try to tackle them for you. Absolutely. Uh, on behalf of Karis Nafty and the good Seth Nelson, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.